We live in a world that is beyond our control, and life is in a constant flux of change. So we have a decision to make. Keep trying to control a storm that's not going to go away, or start learning how to live within the rain. Glenn Pemberton, Hurting with God. Why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Psalm 10. Barns burnt down. Now I can see the moon. Mizuda Masahide. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? Psalm 22. As the Spirit laments within us, so we become, even in our self-isolation, small shrines where the presence and healing love of God can dwell. N.T. Wright. I am worn out, calling for help. My throat is parched. My eyes fail, looking for my God. Psalm 69. When brokenness becomes your life, Lament helps you turn to God. It lifts your head and turns your tear-filled eyes toward the only hope you have, God's grace. Mark Vrogop. O oh God, why have you rejected us forever? Psalm 74. Hope is delicate suffering. Amiri Baraka. Take heart for I have overcome the world, Jesus. Well, good morning, friends. Welcome to the beginning of our new series, Hope, where we're journeying through the, the, the Lent, the Lenten season, and engaging with these spiritual practices, these rhythms of faith, uh, some of which might seem very, very um, foreign. Even the notion of Lent, uh, maybe this is like your first time uh, checking out a church, maybe you're listening online or you're a visitor to one of our parishes and you're like, what does that even mean? Lent is the season, it literally means lengthening, is extending and stepping into the suffering of Jesus and journeying with him as a community uh, towards resurrection and healing and hope, which is the end of the story. But we name that this is the in-between, this is the now and not yet, whether it be in... um, the reality of the world right now. Maybe it's, you know, for you as you think of the word, as you think of this posture of like suffering alongside, of long suffering, you know, it's the day-to-day monotony of a city that just continues to drive by, of urban poverty, of day in, day out, the same thing. God, where are you? What are you doing? Maybe it's the invasion of Ukraine and the disparity of power and suffering that people are are going through right now. And you're wondering like, how could we be talking about anything else? How does the world just continue to roll on when so many people are in the in-between space of tragedy, of suffering, of death, of violence? Or maybe for you, this is all too real, where you have experienced pain, where the season of lament has been uh, a long one for you. I wanna encourage you, invite you to close your eyes right now. Wherever you're at, maybe you're listening uh, later on and you're you know, at home in your living room, close your eyes right now, or here together at one of our parishes, close your eyes right now. And let's slow down for just a second. When you hear the word lament, what image does that conjure up? When you hear the word lament, what feeling does that bubble to the surface? When you hear the word lament, what season are you snapped back to? Or what associated word comes to mind?
I want you to hold on to that word, that image, that phrase, whatever bubbled up there by the Spirit. I want you to hold on to that throughout our time uh, together this morning. And I'll make mention right now, this is a trigger warning. Um, I'm hopeful that we will end on a note of hope, of care and connection for each other. But this sermon, this teaching is going to be intentionally heavy, which I don't know that we always create a lot of space for uh, in our faith communities, maybe even our church. I remember a few years ago, um, I was journeying with a very good friend of mine who went through uh, just calamity, just calamity, suffering and suffering. She'd had a very difficult family life. Uh, and then one of her like closest uh, confidants and friends died suddenly. And I remember thinking like, God, why her? Like, what? How is it possible that there's more for her to handle? Like her whole life has been lament. And then a short time after that, maybe a month or so, we were having coffee uh, and connecting with some other friends, all of whom were Christians and all of whom were, were well intent, well intent. And one of our mutual friends kind of like came up to her and patted her on the shoulder and said, I heard what you've gone through. That's really tough, but don't worry, you'll get through it. Jesus is Lord and walked away. None of that's untrue, right? None of that is untrue. However, I remember looking at her and seeing her face kind of drop and she kind of just kind of side smiled. And I looked at her and I was like, I don't feel like that was helpful. And she was like, yeah, it wasn't, but I understand. People struggle with their own pain, much less someone else's. So that's kind of typical of the responses that I've got in the season. And so when I think of the word lament, that is the word that sticks with me. struggle. Now, maybe for you, it's, it's something else. Maybe for you, it's less specific or more specific, or maybe for you, like you are, um, you know, one of those people that we as a community, those of us who are struggling need to lean in and lean on. And you're like, yes, but, but there's goodness, there's grace in this season. And amen, we agree. It's fascinating that as I was studying for this, uh, this series and also this sermon, I don't think, um, I don't think I recognize the, the meta narrative, the overall story of lament that God invites us into in the Bible. The scripture is rife, is, is full of stories of honest crying out, of putting those words into phrases, of expressing our heartbreak to God. In fact, there's this whole book called Lamentations, a whole book called Lamentations that uh, is, is a, a breathtaking group of poems um, that focuses just on this, like why so much pain? In fact, the Hebrew word for lament, uh, the, lamentations is, a, is a, a Greek word that's been rendered into English, but the Hebrew word for it is, is just how. So lament literally means how, which is fascinating because I think, I, I think our minds are, for myself, I, I move very quickly towards why. Like, what is the reason? It's math. This plus this equals this. And if it doesn't equal this, then it, we should go back and figure it out. But the Hebrew posture is how. How do we get here? How did this happen? And how do we navigate through this together? So when you think of the word lament, and you think of your experience, especially if you're a person of faith, how do those two things come together? What have your experiences been, especially in a community of faith? You know, we don't often talk about these things. Like, you know, when it, when it comes to the postures, the rhythms of, of um, connecting with each other in community and with Jesus, joy, yes. Worship, yes, for sure. Gladness, hope, victory, grace, all the things, yep. But when is the last time we honestly openly and unashamedly lamented these things, suffering. The, the plans that didn't happen, the grief of things that we thought like would never happen, and now they are happening. The pain of things shifting and changing, the ways that we couldn't see or sense or hear God, things that made us feel like not whole, times where we experienced maybe deep and catastrophic loss. My friends, the point is not why the point is not necessarily speeding through these feelings, but the point is how. How do we stay in it? How do we see God at work even in our pain and in our lament? My friends, there's room for God in all of this. There's room in our faith for it. There's room in the grace of Jesus for all of this. 
I'll invite you to turn in your Bibles to Lamentations. Uh, we're gonna start in chapter five. We're gonna jump all over the place. Um, it's after Isaiah and Jeremiah. So it's in the Old Testament, the, the right half of the book. Uh, and then it's just a very short and really um, obscure book of poems. Now, when you read Lamentations, it's what this is. This is like a, an acrostic group of poems that features four characters in the book, only three of which are mentioned. And it starts out in a, a very real and raw tone. So Lamentations chapter one, verse one, <laughs> here's how it goes. Be encouraged. Jerusalem, once so full of people, is now gone, deserted, destroyed. She, who was once great among the nations, now sits alone like a widow. Once the queen of all the earth, she's now a slave. She sobs through the night. Tears stream down her cheeks among all of her family, loved ones, and lovers. There is no one left to comfort her. All of her friends have betrayed her and become her enemies. Judah, Jerusalem, has been led away into captivity, oppressed with cruel slavery. She lives among foreign nations and has no place of rest. Her enemies have chased her down, and she has nowhere left to turn. What a Hallmark car card that is. Now, this is not happenstance. The, the, the context for the book of Lamentations is looking back, most likely it's the, the prophet uh, Jeremiah, who's looking back on the destruction of Jerusalem, the most devastating experience that the faith world has ever been through. And so what happened is in the year, um, you know, in the, the fifth or sixth century BCE, Jerusalem was conquered by the Babylonians. War took over and the known faith world, the epicenter, the locus of where God is and how God is meant to be a blessing was flattened. And modern warfare at the time had evolved to a different level of cruelty. Now, um, ancient cities were, were walled in. And so there was no like, you know, planes or helicopters or uh, drone bomb drops, which we're seeing so much of today. It was, um, you know, horses, infantry, uh, you, you sieged a city, you tried to get through the wall. And the Babylonians in particular had a, a strange and destructive uh, methodology in how they did it. They would besiege the walls, which actually became a very normative part of warfare after the Babylonian conquer of Jerusalem. And so what that meant is um, the, the army would go to the city walls and these city walls were quite high. So you had to make effort to get over it. Typical warfare at the, warfare at the time was bring ladders or, or um, uh, you know, structures to get up and over the wall and then fight and fight and fight. And it usually resulted in a lot of uh, death on both sides. But the Babylonians would besiege the wall and then build a secondary structure, almost like a reverse moat against the wall of Jerusalem. And then they would wait. Eventually, once, and then they would, they would destroy, uh, they would cut off all supply lines. And eventually the people inside the city would have to come out and they would be killed and rinse and repeat and rinse and repeat. The same thing would happen over and over and over until eventually the, the loud cries in the city became faint and weak. The Babylonians would set up camp right outside the wall, besiege the city, build a secondary wall and wait until the city starved and died. And then eventually they would get over the wall, um, kill every, um, man inside of the city structure and usually take women and children uh, away to Babylon um, to be enslaved. So imagine as an Israelite, you have grown up here and God is with and for us. God is using us to be a blessing to the entire world. This is where God lives in his holy splendor. And then at the end of this year, this experience, there is nothing left. The whole town, the whole city, the temple is left in ruin, burned to the ground, and you as a people group are taken away from everything that you've ever known. And so in the story, we hear four voices. One is the woman, is the daughter of Zion or the, the, the bride of Jerusalem who represents like purity and innocence and like God is doing something. God is birthing new life. And then there's the man who, who represents power, uh, you know, and purpose. And then there's the narrator or like the cosmic voice who it's like the 30,000 foot view of everything that's happening. And then there's God and God says nothing. Nothing. God does not answer the why, but fascinatingly, God enters into the how, the lament of 
his people. I think that's helpful for us, my friends, especially in this season, uh, the world the way that it is, uh, these like violent repeat um, actions that we as humanity cannot seem to step past the, qu- the quickness that we try and escape pain and suffering and move wholly towards pleasure. I just want to feel, look, act, seem better than I am. And lament- Lamentations calls us back, this posture of lament calls us back to sitting, slowing down, and to being authentically ourselves. What does it mean to stay in lament? Not just speeding towards the why, but speeding, staying within the how. How is God speaking? How is God entering into our suffering? How is God moving us towards hope? Lamentations is an ancient tradition, a practice of naming what is and what isn't, what should and should not be, but more so it's, it's how we're meant to do this together. When hope and, see, and healing seems too far away, even when God seems silent, we are meant to do this together. In Jewish tradition, lamentations, and even like the, the Lenten season is like, it's, the, lang- it's the, the language of thinness, the language of the border, the authentic us-ness, the words and pain and cries that bubble up from the depths of our being. You may have heard it said, when we don't deal with our pain, it goes into the basement and lifts weights. Lament is the coming up to the surface as being honest, integral with where we are in the space between where we know we should be and the road to hope that I hope we are all on. And so I think the narrative of of scripture is helpful in three ways. Number one, uh, prayer. Number two, Petition and protest, and number three, lament is the acknowledgement of pain. Um, If you're not in a home church, this is a great commercial for you to get in home church. We need to be in tight together, especially in this season, brothers and sisters, and you're gonna be talking um, lots through uh, the book of Lamentations and a couple others, but just for the sake of time, uh, I wanna just give a high-level overview and then um, walk us through an exercise in silence as well. So lament is prayer. If you skip over to uh, Lamentations chapter five, which is the ending of the poem. Now, typically in our Western sensibilities, when when we're resolving a poem or a song or or a dance, there's there's like an up and to the right uh, trajectory. Like we want to feel the goodness of like, yes, but. Despite all these troubles, yes, but. Here's where we're landing. And the ending of uh, Lamentations goes like this. And this is the voice of like the the narrator, the, the community the community praying together, uh, just like this. Joy is gone from our hearts. Our dancing has turned to mourning. The crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. Because of this, our hearts are faint. Because of these things, our eyes grow dim and sad. For Mount Zion, which lies desolate, the city of Jerusalem, which lies desolate with jackals prowling all over it. You, Lord, reign forever, though. Your throne endures from generation to generation. Why do you always forget us? Why do you forsake us so long? Restore us to yourself, Lord, that we may return, renew our days as of old, unless you've utterly rejected us and are angry with us beyond measure. And then if you flip over, nope, that's where Lamentations ends. Now it's fascinating Um, This might seem unsettling if you've never heard this before, but our Jewish brothers and sisters, we have so much to learn from this ancient tradition. Our Jewish brothers and sisters, this is a regular rhythm in their uh, liturgy of faith and practice, is to set aside time and even once annually to commemorate the experience of lamentations, of what does it mean to be authentically connected, to call out in prayer. And does God invite that? Yes, he does. Now, depending on the religious tradition that you grew up with, maybe, you know, you hear a prayer, you hear scripture like that, and you're like, whoa, that is a, that's a, you know, a non-coffee morning. What, what's going on there? Or maybe in your religious tradition, or even in like, you know, the way that you grew up with parents, you see God as like clenched fist angry, you don't talk back. This is far from the picture that we see in scripture. Throughout the lament, uh, Lamentations uh, poem, we see this rhythm of prayer, lament as prayer, this rhythm of prayer that these people are calling out to God 
explaining what they see as wrong, confessing their own hardships, their own doubts, their own struggle, their own grief, but then returning to partnership with God and with each other and memorializing it, that we lament, we sit in the pocket of grief because it's healthy, it's helpful for us to be in it together, not just to speed through it individually as fast as possible. The fascinating thing about lament as prayer is that it it invites public mourning. It invites us to, to externalize what is internal. It invites to the surface what maybe has gone down to the basement and has been lifting weights. It exposes our truest selves to being given permission to say, God, this hurts. Hear our cries, hear our prayer, O Lord. How long will you reject us? You reign forever, help us. Imagine if that was the language of our prayer connectedly. Imagine if that was the semblance of like our community uh, moving forward in our present season and the season to come. If instead of individualizing our pain, we linked arms connected with each other, knowing that God is moving us towards hope, but knowing that God is here in the pain and the in-between and the lengthening phase of laments. Number two, lament is petition. Uh, just for the sake of time, of time, I'm not gonna read through uh, Lamentations chapter three, um, but I invite you to do so. It's fascinating and unsettling and uncomfortable. Lamentations chapter three is the voice of the man, and this is the man petitioning. I thought we were strong. God, where are you? Are you sleeping? Uh, this is the prophet Jeremiah, most scholars think, who also said, God, you have ruined my life. You have to change things. Wake up, do something. And God is here for it, doesn't correct. Instead, enters in, gives space for, and feels it too. It's fascinating that the, the male voice like straddles the line of reverence for God, but also petitioning and pushing on God as well. Like, do you not see this? What are you doing? How are you acting? This isn't right. And then it becomes the communal voice as well, the communal voice of protest, correction, and care of people saying, this can't be the way. This can't be the way. What are we going to do about it? Petition and protest and holding each other saying, God, help us through it. Wake up, Lord. Lead us towards healing and hope and resurrection and correction and care. I think once again, this is one of the ways that we push against meaningless suffering and pain of of slowing down, not speeding through it, but to dignify it, to look at each other and our pain and our suffering and saying, this is the human experience. I see you, I'm here with you. I'm not willing to just give pad answers, but I'm willing to suffer alongside, long suffering, long obedience to the other, long care for the other in the same direction, in and through suffering and pain, preparing the way for remedy and healing, naming what's wrong, out of order and inhumane, reminding the community of where we've been and where we're meant to return, and then most importantly, exposing what stands in the way of hope. Exposing what stands in the way of hope. And for many of us, what stands as the biggest barrier towards hope is pain, is the difficulty, the suffering, the death, the loss, the tragedy, the inequality, the silence of pain that we've experienced. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say when we pictured a word or a phrase or an idea at the beginning, it probably wasn't very hard to come up with something. Now in the notion of like ancient Judaism, if you ask the questions, if we were to hop in a time machine and go back to like the fifth, sixth century BCE and we ask like, where are the gods in all of this? Outside of Judaism, where are the gods in all of this? Most likely, likely the answer would have been like, well, somewhere else, they're somewhere else and they're angry and it's this balance of trying to appease and serve and connect, but also stay distant. The gods are transcendent elsewhere, uninvolved. And in this story, and certainly the story and the experience of Jesus, everything changes. In Jesus, we see that God enters into pain, doesn't stand apart from it. Are you familiar with this phrase? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I see some nodding heads. 
This is one of the last things that Jesus says on the cross as the people that he has came to save, as the religion that he has come to tear down and reconcile back to the heart of God are killing him. He is on the cross, sacrificing himself in the name of love and other centeredness. And he repeats this phrase out of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why do you stand so far off? So what is Jesus saying there? In the tradition of the rabbis at the time, in the tradition of the Jewish martyrs, Jesus is entering into the suffering story of Judaism at the time, saying, I am here with, I don't stand apart. I'm calling out a a phrase that would have been common in, in Jewish funerals, saying, God has always been here. And now Jesus, God made flesh, is entering into human pain and suffering and redeeming it, reconciling it towards Hope, not speeding through it, suffering alongside, in, through, and with, not somewhere else. This is a lengthening, an expanding of the suffering of humanity made real and visible in the person of Jesus. And so when we read that, which can be unsettling, when we read Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is, you know, my, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We can get confused. We can say like, what is this? Is this Jesus doubting? Is this Jesus like pushing back, feeling the absence uh, of God, feeling alone? Maybe. Is this Jesus holding a clenched fist to the sky and saying, you deserted me? Maybe. Most likely, this is Jesus entering fully in to the feelings, those word pictures of his brothers and sisters, of us today in the midst of pain, not breezing through it, but entering into it, standing in solidarity and union with community in the midst of devastating human pain and suffering in a world that has turned upside down, but moving humanity towards hope, slowly. When I was young, um, my sister died. My parents were uh, new to faith. We had just started um, taking part in this faith community. And, uh, you know, and it was right around this season, um, like this calendar season right now. I just talked to my parents this past Thursday and we were kind of reminiscing what that felt like, what it felt like to lose an 11 year old daughter, a sister to, to me friend to many, and the rhythms that you go about, like, why, how, what, 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 did the, what is the purpose? She had gone to a friend's house. They had like a, a little friend sleepover. She came back to our house, our family home, mentioned that she wasn't feeling well. They took her to the doctor. The doctor was like, it's probably just a flu, a cold. Um, don't worry, take her back home. She got kind of progressively worse. They went back to the hospital. The hospital said, we'll admit her and ran an IV just to keep her hydrated. My parents got sent back home to just get some rest. In the middle of the night, they got a phone call that Sandy was critical to come back. And my parents got there just as soon as she passed away. My God, my God, why? Why? But my parents' experience of the story was certainly those questions like we, that we just still don't have answers to. But was more impactful for them to this day was not the why, it was the how. Now you remember they were new Christians at the time, had just, um, you know, been part of this church community and the first person there at the hospital as Sandy passed away was uh, our pastor, this, this spiritual caregiver as part of our community. And what he said to them has never left them to this day. He said, I have no answers for you. I don't know why this has happened, but till the day that I die, I'm committing to being with you, to being alongside you in your pain and grief. And that's legit. He has been. Like we just talked to him a few, like this is years and decades and decades ago, and he is still connected to our family. Many times in our, in our faith journey or, or even in our faith communities, we want to speed towards answers. We want resolve, quickness. Let's fix it. Let's get through it. But maybe the better thing for us as a faith community as we journey with Jesus and, and link arms with people who are struggling and suffering is not that like, well, everything happens for a reason, but instead is the reason I'm here is to journey with you 
to care for you in and through this. Have you noticed all of these words and phrases? These are the words of our community. And it's fascinating, more often than not, when when we go through suffering, what is our tendency? Is our tendency to sit in the pocket of these words or is our tendency to be like, no, I just want it to go away. I just wish it was, I just wish it was gone. Like, Lord, get us through us through this, heal it, let's be done with it. And instead God says, no. The best way that you can love and serve and embody the ethic of Jesus is to stay in the pocket, to stay in the posture, to engage with lament. It is not the why that always helps, but the how. So brothers and sisters, when you find yourself struggling, suffering, when you find yourself walking with deep pain that has gone down into the basement, may you be encouraged that you serve and are loved by a God who invites it to come out. When you find yourself feeling alone and lament in this long period of in-between space with a fist to the air saying like, what is going on and why? May you know that you serve and are loved by a God that partners with you in this and suffers alongside us. And when you find yourself feeling physically, emotionally, mentally, and even spiritually alone, may you know and be encouraged that this is the mission of the church. This is the body of Christ that doesn't leave you or us alone, but that steps in, links arms and says, let's do this together. And may you know that the grace of God, the love of God, the pain of God, and the covenant commitment of God is with you and with me and with us, always moving us towards hope.